Well, welcome <coughs> everyone to uh, church uh, this Sunday. It's really good to see all of you. And um, uh, whether you're joining us uh, through Zoom or if you're watching um, <coughs> via uh, our uh, YouTube channel uh, or maybe even listening in, it's really good to, to be uh, with one another. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, meeting together with Zoom is that we can see one another and actually interact with one another. And uh, at the end of our service, we'll have a chance to do that. Um, uh, you'll be invited to, to join a small group in the breakout room uh, where we can actually uh, get to know one another uh, and uh, maybe even have a cup of tea together. Um, today, we are looking at a very interesting part of the Bible from the Book of Revelation. Uh, because of what's happening this year, uh, many of us are turning our minds to, well, what is God saying uh, to us? Uh, is God saying anything? Uh, is he saying something about uh, what's going to happen in the future? Um, the part of the Bible is uh, the very last book in the Bible, uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, it's a very, very complicated and mysterious book. And we're looking at three chapters of that book today. Uh, one of the things that, uh, you, that may help you in focusing <coughs> on what's happening uh, is, uh, is, uh, is to actually take a, a piece of paper and maybe write things down uh, as you hear them. Um, they'll help you to focus on what's happening. Um, let me take you to the next slide uh, in a very traditional uh, Anglican way. Ang yep. Um, the Bible, of course, uh, see what we do together as very, very important. Um, so, uh, let me read to you from part of what the Bible says. Uh, let us consider how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Uh, we are gathering together uh, around the word of God and we know that uh, the day is coming and uh, that's what we've come to do today. Let me read to you uh, as well, too, from Psalm 11, talking about Jesus. Uh, he's called a stone. He's uh, the picture of a, a building. Uh, the, the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Uh, it talks uh, in anticipation about the events of Easter. Uh, Jesus is rejected by the world, uh, but uh, in his rejection uh, is not the end of the story. Uh, God is actually continuing his work. So why have we come together? Uh, why are we here? Uh, we have come together to meet with God. So there's a vertical relationship, uh, but also to express our fellowship in the Lord Jesus. There's a horizontal aspect to what we do. We come together to take part in our part in the building up of his church. We'll praise and thank God for his goodness towards us. We will hear from his holy word. We'll pray for the world as well as to pray for one another and as well as ourselves. One of the things that we do as Christians as we get together is to sing praises to our great God. And, uh, and that's what we're going to do next. And I'm going to uh, hand the time over to James and Angie to help us to do that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Brian. So today is a great day for us to sing God's praises. And let us remind ourselves that uh, no matter what we face, no matter the highs or the lows that we see on our day-to-day -day lives, uh, we know that our God is for us and that he loves us um, and that no love, that can, love cannot, uh, cannot be separated.
One of the enormous privileges um, I think we have is that we can actually uh, come before God together uh, as a family, uh, as a church family, uh, as well as a, a physical family. Uh, it, in fact, is one of the things I really, really miss uh, to be able to sit together around the Word of God with Jen and the kids uh, on a Sunday morning. Uh, but many of you do have that uh, privilege. Uh, you are there with your kids. And uh, we love to, to demonstrate to our kids what it means for us to respond to our God uh, in his mercy and his love. And uh, one of the things that uh, we try to do is to help parents to do that uh, in, um, uh, through a thing called Family Spot. So in our next uh, five uh, to seven minutes, I'm going to give the time over to uh, a video that's been uh, generously provided to, uh, to us by an organization called QuizWorks uh, that hopefully will help uh, enable uh, parents to talk to their kids about um, um, things that are really, really important. So for the next seven minutes, uh, may I give uh, direct your attention uh, to what's on the screen on a video produced by QuizWorks. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Matt. That's Scruff. Scruff. Scruff, we, we can't hear you. You'll have to unmute. Is that better? Yeah, m m much better. Um, what, what did you want? Oh, nothing in particular. I was just a bit bored and. And I wanted someone to talk to. Right. Well, today on QuizWorks Home Delivery, Chrissy is going to be sharing about how we can talk to God anywhere at any time about anything. Let's watch. Cool. Hi, everyone. I'm Chrissy. I wonder how you're feeling today. Maybe you're feeling happy. How about we all make a really big happy face? It's great to feel happy, isn't it? But we don't always feel happy, do we? Maybe you're feeling sad today. Let's all make a sad face. I wonder what makes you feel sad or worried. 
I know sometimes I feel sad when I run out of my favorite food. And sometimes I feel sad when I'm feeling sick. And sometimes I feel sad when I've had a fight with someone I love. And sometimes I feel sad and a bit worried because sad and scary things are happening in our world. But did you know the Bible tells us that we can talk to God about anything, anytime, anywhere. Whether we're feeling happy or sad or somewhere in between, we can always talk to God. And I'm going to teach you a song now, which is going to help us remember that. We're going to sing it to the tune of Open, Shut Them, Open, Shut Them. But we're going to learn different words and different actions. And some of those actions will be in sign language. I'll teach it to you. Then you can join in when you feel ready. It goes like this. Talk to God. You can talk to God because of Jesus. Talk to God. You can talk to God. He will always hear us. If you're glad or if you're sad or if you're in between No matter how you're feeling now, God is listening Great job. I'm going to tell you a story. This is Angie. Angie loved Jesus. And Angie was having a really happy day. See, Angie's teacher had just given Angie her report card. And Angie had gotten top marks in everything. And today was also Angie's birthday. And Angie had just received exactly what she wanted. A brand new puppy dog. And best of all, Angie and her family were soon to go on a holiday to the beach. And Angie was even going to get to fly in an aeroplane to get there. Zoom, 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 zoom. All of this made Angie feel really, really happy. And so Angie, well, she wondered if she could talk to God about how happy she was feeling. And then Angie remembered this song. Talk to God, you can talk to God because of Jesus. Talk to God, you can talk to God. He will always hear us. If you're glad or if you're sad or if you're in between, no matter how you're feeling now, God is listening. And so Angie did talk to God. And she thanked God for all the good things he had given her. And Angie knew that God was listening to her prayer because of Jesus. But Angie didn't always feel happy. Sometimes Angie felt sad. One time, Angie had fallen over in the playground and really hurt her knee. Ow! And Angie's teacher came to give her some help. And one time, Angie's dog got really, really sick. And when they took him to the vet, well, the vet told her, that her dog might not be able to stay alive much longer. And worst of all, the holiday that Angie and her family were soon to be going on, it had to be cancelled because lots and lots of people were getting sick. All of this made Angie feel really, really sad. And so Angie wondered whether she could talk to God about how sad she was feeling. And then Angie remembered this song. Talk to God, you can talk to God because of Jesus. 
talk to God, you can talk to God. He will always hear us. If you're glad or if you're sad or if you're in between, no matter how you're feeling now, God is listening. And so Angie did talk to God. And she told God about how sad she was feeling. And Angie knew that God was listening to her prayers because of Jesus. Well, kids, sometimes sad and scary things happen. Sometimes we just don't know what's going on. But if you love Jesus, then you can talk to God anytime, anywhere about anything, whether you're feeling happy or sad or somewhere in between, you can always talk to God and he will always listen. So make sure you do talk to God anytime and do that by yourselves, with your family, with your church and know that he is always listening because of Jesus. It's a message not only for um, the kids, but also for adults as well too. Uh, We may be feeling sad, we may be feeling happy or something in between, uh, but we can always talk to God because of Jesus. That's the sign for Jesus. Um, It's uh, great that we can come to God uh, with all sorts of things, uh, even with our failures, uh, even when we do wrong things against him and other people. Um, and so we're going to do that. Uh, we're going to spend a moment uh, turning to our God, um, acknowledging our many failures against him and other people. Uh, uh, Christians call this the confession. Uh, uh, in our world, uh, there is, you know, we keep telling, um, there's really no chance to actually do that. Um, but uh, as Christians, as we get together, uh, we do get a chance to do that. So before we we do this, uh, by saying a prayer called the General Confession, I'm going to give uh, you about half a minute um, to to think about that, to think about uh, uh, maybe there are things that you've done uh, that you're ashamed of uh, this week um, against other people or against God, and uh, and to bring those before God uh, through Jesus, and he promised that he'll listen and he'll forgive. So let me give you half a minute to, to reflect on that. Friends, uh, let me uh, invite you to turn to the slide, the next slide, or to your order of service, and um, and to say together with me uh, the prayer of confession. Either the next slide or the, the order of service. Angus. I'll lead us in this prayer. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And uh, let me read to you the words of assurance for those who truly turn to Christ. Next slide. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Of course, our God is a faithful God, and he will fulfill all his promises, and and he is true to his word. We have confessed our sins to him. He has forgiven us because his son, Jesus, has died for us. Amen. Uh, As uh, we indicated, uh, we are turning to a part of God's word. 
uh, that talks about our present situation as well as the future. Uh, it is a difficult word to understand. And uh, so Alan's gonna help us uh, to, uh, to read that word. I'm gonna give the time over to Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my name is Alan, one of the ministers. And it's great that we can gather here this morning, even though online, to encourage one another and be encouraged by each other and ultimately by God and his word. Well, a few weeks ago, we did start the book of, of Revelation. We started to look at that. And it was such a good and timely message, especially in the light of the COVID situation. It encouraged us to identify our idols, to know that Jesus is king, and to know that Jesus provides the only solution to our greatest problem, our greatest problem being our sin. We then have our Easter weekend, and we're now continuing the series of Revelation. But before we dive back into the book of Revelation, we need to ask ourselves a question, which we didn't get to think about much. And that question is, how do we read a book like Revelation? Now, the word Revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypse. And the word apocalypse refers to the end of the world. And there have been so many ideas about the end of the world. There have been so many movies written about the apocalypse. Now, up on your screen, a few pictures of movie titles, which you may have seen, including World War Z, The Terminator, Matrix, I Am Legend, 2012, and the list goes on. Different religions have different ideas about the end of the world, and even Christians have different thoughts about what the end may look like. And it is something like the book of Revelation that can generate so many ideas and thoughts about how the world will end. So how are we to read a book like Revelation? Well, here are some guidelines. First of all, some general guidelines. Now, these guidelines are helpful not just for Revelation, but for the Bible in general. And the first thing is to know the context. If you're reading a book, any book, and you come to a part where you don't understand, you usually get an idea of what it's trying to say by looking at what comes before and after. And likewise, for the Bible, if we come to a passage which we don't understand, what will help us is to know what comes before, what comes after, why the book was written, where it's fitted in the book, where it fits in the Bible, and that will help us to understand what the passage is saying. So as we keep praying and reading the passage, this will help us to understand what it is saying most of the time, if not all of the time. The second thing is to know the original audience. Now, it's very easy to read a part of the Bible and to think that it speaks directly to us. It is speaking to us, but it is firstly speaking to its original audience. And we need to understand what is God is saying to the original audience before we apply it to ourselves. So for the book of Revelation, it was written to, firstly, Christians who are being persecuted by the Roman Empire. These Christians were told to either worship the empire or be punished. This is a picture up on your screen, which was drawn by Jerome in 1883. And this was his impression of what the Christians may have gone through during this time. And you see in that picture, people being fed to the lions, crucified, burned alive. So for the book of Revelation, it was written to encourage Christians who are being killed for their faith and their witness to remain firm and hopeful. And understanding this will help us to understand what it means for us today. The third guideline, the third general guideline, is that the Bible interprets the Bible. So if we don't understand a particular part of the Bible, we can look at what the rest of the Bible says about this topic to help us to understand that passage. So in the first few chapters of Revelation, we saw images of what Jesus is like. He's described with white hair, feet of bronze, and also a lamb who has been slain. Now, all these images allude to images that have been told to people in the Old Testament, in the part of the Bible written before Jesus. So as we look at these images, we 
are alluded to different parts of the Bible, which also use these images. So the Bible helps interpret the Bible. Now, these are some general guidelines. Let us look at Revelation in particular. And there are some specific guidelines as we keep looking through these next few chapters. The first thing is that it can be symbolic. As we read through Revelation, there are images, numbers, shapes, and other symbols which emphasize different things. Up on your screen is a picture of Australia. Now, in this picture, we can see that on the east, there's the Pacific Ocean, and on the west, there's the Indian Ocean. On the next slide is also a picture of Australia, and it is the coat of arms. It shows a kangaroo and an emu holding an emblem. Now, as we see this picture of Australia, we don't expect to see a kangaroo, a real life kangaroo and a real life emu carrying an emblem. But what it is depicting are certain things that we want to display about Australia. So for the kangaroo and the emu, they are both special to Australia and they are both animals which find it hard to walk backwards. And so as Australia is represented by this coat of arms, it's actually representing a nation that seeks to keep going forwards, not going backwards, that keeps seeking to make progress. So as we look at the book of Revelation, we can see different images that represent different things and emphasize different things. So the number seven can emphasize completion, as in God creating the world in seven days. The number 12 representing the complete number of the 12 tribes of Israel. Four can represent the four ends of the world and so on. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the book of Revelation is a battle. God versus Satan, good versus evil, the world to come versus this world, this world which is being ruled by sinful rulers. And it's a book to show us who will win in the end. And sorry to spoil it for you, but the winner, the conqueror, the victor in the end is God. And the book of Revelation helps us to understand that. And the final guideline we'll have for this morning is that there are timeless truths. There are timeless truths. You see, in the book of Revelation, there will be some things which are hard to understand and some things that will be hard to be specific about. This can be due to our knowledge or the period we are living in at the moment. And we need to leave it as that and not conclude things which the author didn't intend to conclude. But the things that we are sure about, we need to hold on to them as eternal, amazing, and timeless truths. So these are some guidelines as we look at the book of Revelation and be encouraged by what God is trying to say. Now, it's been a few weeks since we looked at Revelation. Let's have a quick summary before we dive in to the focus passage for this morning. We started with Revelation chapter 1, and that gave us an image of Jesus, who is powerful and the one who rules. We didn't look at chapter 2 and 3, but there, God is encouraging his churches and Christians to remain firm and to not lose their first love. Then we had a look at chapter 4 and 5, and we see how all creation will worship God. Two weeks ago, my discipleship group looked at chapter four and five, and they drew a picture to summarize what chapter four and five were about. Now, they only had a few minutes to do this, but it is still helpful. Nonetheless, you'll see it up on your screen. This is a picture of what we drew in Revelation chapter four using a software from Zoom. And here we see all of creation worshiping God and the lamb who has been slain. In the next slide, you see that there is a scroll with seven seals and no one can open this scroll. No one except for the lamb who has been slain. And you see that the lamb who has been slain at the bottom of that picture there. And this is where we come to, the lamb who has been slain, chapter six. So with that, Hopefully that gives us a good grounding and a guideline and a framework to look at the book of Revelation. I'll pray. I'll pass it to Carmen, who read through chapter 6. We'll then sing a song before Annie comes up to then look at chapter 7 and a bit of chapter 8. 
let us pray as we ask God to help us to understand these chapters. Father God, thank you for making yourself known to us, showing the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach us through your word so that may, we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll pass it over to Carmen. Okay, so today we'll be reading from, um, I'll be reading from Revelation 6. So feel free to um, open up your physical Bibles or you may follow from our outline or from the screen in front of us. Um, okay, all right. Verse one, I watched as a lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the seal, second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. <clears throat> its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the living, third living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the, sword, of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters were killed just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. <clears throat> the whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from his place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? What an image that is, as we see what's happening in the throne room of God, um, as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word in this uh, sermon, uh, let us remind ourselves that uh, we are before the throne of God, and what an amazing privilege to know that uh, we are loved by him and that he is powerful. So will you join with me as we sing Before the Throne?
Christ my Saviour and my God, with Christ my Saviour and my God. Amen. We're going to continue reading God's Word and Revelation 7 now. The next Bible reading is from Revelation 7 to chapter 8, verse 5. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Jam. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He would lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden, on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Wow. That's Revelation 6, 7, and a bit of 8. What do we make of all that? What do we make of all that? There were angels, seals, disasters, people from different nations. Well, as we look at these chapters, there are three key things that we can get out from these chapters to encourage us. And the first thing is that God will judge the world. God will judge the world. It is good for God to judge those who have done wrong. Now, we know people who have lied about their tax, their job interviews, or to their families and have gotten away with it. We've heard of people who've stolen, killed, and raped that haven't been caught or punished. And there have been Christians who have been tortured and killed, and their perpetrators haven't been brought 
to justice. God wants us to know that he will judge all those who do evil. They may escape judgment in this world, but they will not escape God's judgment. And God's judgments are severe and terrible. In chapter seven, in the seven seals are portrayed for us in chapter six and eight. And let's have a look at them about how terrible these judgments are. <clears throat> So we got the lamb who is slain. He has a scroll with the seven seals. And after he opens the first seal, a white horse comes out. And a horse represents something that is powerful, swift. And it's white to represent victory. And then the lamb opens the second seal and the red horse comes out. Now the color red represents blood, all the blood that will be shed. And then after the third seal has been opened, a black horse comes out. And black emphasizes famine. Now, during this coronavirus situation, some of us are finding it hard to buy stuff, whether it is hand sanitizer, tissue paper, rice, whatever it may be. But the image that is portrayed here is that as a result of God's judgment, there will be such a severe famine in the world that even basic necessities are hard to find. One kilogram of wheat, which now costs about $5, will cost about $150. These will be terrible and difficult times. Then the fourth seal is open. And when that opens, a pale horse comes out, the color of a corpse. And that is to represent all the death that will happen. And then the fifth seal is open. And we see Christians who have been killed calling out for justice calling out for vengeance. And then God tells these people, judgment will come very soon. So not only will judgment be terrible, but judgment will happen very soon. And then the sixth seal is open. And with this seal, we see earthquakes and darkness. And you see that the judgment is so bad that people call out for the mountains to fall on them. They much prefer mountains falling on them than to face the wrath of God and the Lamb. That will be how terrible it is. See what it says in verse 16? They called to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? After the seventh seal is opened, there's thunder and lightning. What we see in these chapters what we see as the seals are open is that God's judgment is terrible and it will happen soon. And there's nothing worse than this. As we look at the COVID-19 situation, some of us may think that the book of Revelation is talking about this situation. And people have described it as a pandemic. It's unprecedented. However, the Bible does not specify that this is talking about COVID-19. So if the Bible doesn't say that it is, we need to be careful to not say that it is. Otherwise, we'll be saying more than what the Bible is trying to say, acting as if we're God or a prophet. The other thing to realize is that God's judgment is awful. And as bad as COVID-19 is, we do need to realize, we do need to realize that God's final judgment is much, much, much worse. God's message is clear. If you are sinful, if you are evil, if you have done wrong, if you haven't treated God as God, then God's judgment is waiting for you. And there is nothing worse than facing God's judgment. That's the first thing we see from these chapters. The second thing we see is that despite God's judgment being so terrible, God will save his people. God will save his people. <clears throat> In the middle of all these terrible judgments, we see that God will protect his people. And the author uses a writing technique to emphasize these. You see, out of all these seven seals being opened, right in the middle of it, we see God protecting his people. In between seal number six and seven, we see 
a picture of God protecting his people amidst all the destruction and harm, we see an image of harmony and of heaven. Look at what it says in chapter 7, verse 1 and 3, which is written between seal number 6 and seal number 7. After this, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. As the seven seals are open, the judgments seem to be getting worse and worse. And then after seal six is open, God sends his angels to hold back the judgment. Why? Well, verse three, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Picture here doesn't mean that Christians won't suffer or die. Jesus suffered and died. In the previous chapter, chapter 6, we heard that Christians have been killed because of their faith and because of their witness. Christians will die and suffer. But what it does mean is that God will bring his people home to heaven. Those who have been sealed by God can look forward to the future that they will have with God. And look at the image of this future. Verse 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see the picture of heaven? God will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst. They will be comforted. There won't be any more tears. Jesus, the lamb on the throne, will be their guide and their protector. And in verse 9, it describes this place. It describes a place where there will be people from every tribe, nation, peoples, and languages. No more online gatherings. No more racism. No more fighting. One God, one vision, one body. Now, as we look at this passage, some people look at the number 144,000 and say that there will only be 144,000 Christians or believers who will get to heaven. But that is incorrect because as we look at the statistics, there are apparently over 2 billion Christians in the world today. It's a symbolic number to represent the completeness and the fullness of God's tribe and family. 12 times by 12 times by 1,000, it's complete. And also in verse 9, it says that as John looks to heaven, there's a crowd of people that he can't count. It's numerous. It's not limited. So what we see is that God will protect his people and that the future will be marvelous. And that there is a space for you. There is a space for you. Now, how can, we, how can we be a part of this heavenly reality? How do we know that we've been sealed? How do we know that we are one of God's people? Was by trusting Jesus. Continually trusting Jesus. When it's easy and when it's hard. God will protect those who have been washed by the blood of Jesus. You see what it says in verse 14? These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Some of my children, they love to play in the dirt and their clothes get dirty and we give them new clothes. But for all of us, we have been dirtied by our sin. Yet Jesus died for your sin. He took all the dirt of your sin, placed him on himself on the cross, and gave you new clothes to wear. So that when God sees you, he sees Jesus. Even though we are not clean, he treats us as clean because of the blood of Jesus. 
because of the lamb who has been slain. As we understand this, this should give us great confidence and joy. No matter what the future holds, even though we may not have a job, we may not have enough supplies, we may get sick and we may even die, we are to still trust Jesus and the future awaiting for us. That's the second great promise truth, that God will protect his people. Now let's come to the final key theme of this passage, and that is that God's people are called to witness and worship. Let's read chapter 7, verse 4 to 15. These are they who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. You see the logic here? Because they have been washed clean, verse 14. Therefore, verse 15, they are to serve God day and night. It is not because they have to, but because they can. They have been saved to serve. They have been purified to proclaim about God's goodness. Knowing what Jesus has done for us and for you, knowing what Jesus will do for us, will lead us to praising him. And we won't be able to stop praising him. Eternity won't be enough time to tell about all the good things that Jesus has done for us. So as we are encouraged by these few chapters, we are encouraged to keep trusting to keep witnessing, to keep worshipping Jesus, no matter what happens. Now, not many of us will be called to die for our faith. Not many of us will be called to go to prison or be killed for our belief. But we do need to pray that if that situation and time happens, that we'll be ready. For most of us, it will mean changing what we value and what we put our time in, as opposed to studies, work, or our reputation, to be putting our time and effort into church, relationships, and serving. For most of us, it will mean saying no to sin, laziness, and pride, cutting off our arms and eyes, metaphorically speaking, cutting off our phones and our internet if they cause us to sin and to not be effective as we love God and others. If we have children, if we are discipling people and mentoring people, it will mean that our desire for them is to keep trusting in Jesus rather than having Jesus as an insurance and forget about him as we pursue other things of the world. And for all of us, it means witnessing. The Christians during the time that the book of Revelation was written were being killed and martyred for their faith. And even though they were being killed, imprisoned and burnt, they still kept worshipping and witnessing about Jesus. What a great model and encouragement they are for us. To keep sharing about Jesus, even though it may be hard, even though it may cost us our reputation and our lives. It could mean posting on social media, telling people about Jesus, reaching out to them in love. You see, during this period of COVID-19, there are many reasons to fear and to look out for ourselves. But it is such a great time to love others and to share about God's love, to share about how Jesus purifies and saves us, to share about the future where we can be with God and all good things. Let us pray. Father God, you know what we're going through. You know our hardships, you know our challenges, you know our anxieties and fears. Father, we do not know the future, but we thank you so much that you are the God who knows what the future is and not only knows, but is in control. That you have won Satan, that you have defeated death, that you are the victor over sin. And Father, we are tempted in many ways to fall away and to run after other things and idols, but we pray that we'll understand about who Jesus is and continue to worship and witness about him. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to pass back to Brian, who will lead us in the rest of the service.
Thanks, Alan. Um, the time that we have is uh, very limited. Uh, I hope that uh, what you've heard today um, actually prompts you to be asking more questions about, um, uh, about what's happening, uh, what God is saying. Um, and uh, and uh, you're welcome, of course, to uh, raise those questions. Uh, if you have the order of service, uh, there is a link that you can send your questions or comments to. Uh, we love to hear what you think. And uh, God, in fact, uh, wants us to ask questions uh, because it actually shows that we're thinking about stuff. So let me commend that to you. Um, we are going to sing again, um, Behold Our God. Uh, who is this God uh, who um, all creatures uh, worships in eternity. And uh, I'm going to pass the time over to James and to Angie to lead us in that song. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Brian. So we've learned that our God is a powerful God and his judgment is both fearsome and um, very powerful. But we know that he also saves and we know that Jesus, through the blood of the Lamb, uh, we have life through him. And as a result, um, go and proclaim that to everyone and what better way to do that than do that through song so let's sing our next song behold our god
Thanks, uh, James and Angie. Uh, for those of you who may not um, know this feature, uh, there is a chat function uh, in Zoom. Uh, for those um, who are, uh, let me invite you to have a look at it uh, because uh, Alan and James have shared that link um, for uh, the, the place that we can actually ask our questions uh, and, and give our comments. Now, uh, Revelation is an unveiling, it is a peeling back uh, of the veil so that we can see reality. Uh, what is really going on? Uh, let me read to you from part of the passage that we read today. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hands. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth. And there came pearls of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Our prayers are not wasted. Uh, it is heard, and God will answer them in powerful, powerful ways. We're going to turn now to a time of prayer indeed, and we are confident that our God hears and will answer. Before I hand the time over to Jason to lead us in that uh, corporate prayer, uh, I'm going to lead us in a special prayer for today. O oh, mighty Father, you have given your son Jesus Christ to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant that we may put away the old leaven of corruption and wickedness and always serve you in sincerity and truth through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to hand the time over to Jason, who will lead us in prayer for ourselves as well as for the world. Thanks, Jason. It's fine. We'll be praying for our church, for our missionary partners, for our youths, and for ourselves. Please bow your hands and join us in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, fill our lives with your word and spirit. Enable us to truly believe that the Lord Jesus is risen, that all authority on earth and on heaven has been given to him, that he will be with us to the ends of the earth, so that we will love our neighbors as ourselves and to make disciples of all nations in order to bring glory to you. Please help us to be one in love so that by this, the world will know that you sent Jesus and that you loved us. Please help us to love one another with a sincere love, not just with words, but by what we do. Father, all things are possible for you. May the authorities of the world know and fear you. May Christians keep trusting and following and sharing about the Lord Jesus, that they may promote a country that is safe, moral, and allow religious freedom. We also ask for the ministry of the Matthews and the other Bible translators to transform Papua New Guinea. We ask that Petron, Andy and Jacob will keep growing in Christ and being missional. Thank you that Tony, Calvin's father, has been discharged from the hospital for breathing issues. And we ask that you ignite our hearts to see how commendable it is to bring the gospel to the nations and that you would teach our hearts to not cease praying for these brothers and sisters to you who love them dearly. Father, we pray that our children may have gospel hope as they face fear and anxiety. We know that the kingdom belongs to these, to these little children and the like, because they are the ones who receive the gospel with empty hands and neediness, and therefore they are the greatest in the kingdom. We ask that the parents would know and love Jesus themselves so that the faith of these young people may be protected and nurtured. We also pray for our youth, our high schoolers, and their families to keep growing in Jesus and being a witness during this time of change and uncertainty. May our youths transition well from their different stages of life, especially after primary and to secondary school. We pray that our youth group, Exiles Youth, will be fun and encouraging as the high schoolers wait for Jesus' return and that we may walk in godliness and witness about you. Finally, Father, we pray for ourselves. We pray for growth in faith in you, 
in holiness so that our character will bear witness of you to the world for growth in each other because you loved us first. Help us to remember the reality that Jesus will return in, in a glorious sight so that we know our labors today are not in vain. We ask all of these things for our joy as we long to see the Lord Jesus be adored and worship as his glory demands. In Jesus we pray, amen. Friends, uh, even though we are um, uh, at home, um, church continues. Uh, lots of things happen um, in our church uh, that we may not see. Uh, one of um, our, uh, uh, the three things that uh, defines uh, our mission, uh, we are in the business of making disciples of the nations. Uh, we are in the business of uh, bringing glory to God. And we are also in the business of loving our neighbours. And uh, I just want to share with you one of the examples of how we have tried to do that, even though we are in isolation. Uh, in the picture that you see next, in the slide. Um, some of our Sunday school children have been making uh, crafts, uh, uh, artwork, as well as uh, writing letters um, to uh, particularly the residents of Mary Andrews village in uh, Blakehurst. Uh, this is a, a terribly isolating time, uh, particularly for older people and older people in nursing homes. And uh, we wanted, particularly the children of our Sunday school, wanted the residents of this particular facility to know that they are not forgotten uh, and that they are precious in God's sight and that they are remembered. Uh, so we are very, very thankful for that. Uh, there are lots of opportunities that we can display that love for our neighbours. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, there is an opportunity for all of you to do this. Uh, next slide. Um, there is a, um, uh, most of us are actually quite comfortable where we are. Um, however, uh, that is not true for uh, all the people around us. Uh, there are people who are particularly vulnerable. Um, and uh, um, one of the groups uh, that are uh, vulnerable are migrant workers in our midst. And uh, what we are hearing is that there is an escal a dramatic escalation of people needing food and financial assistance. And, uh, and so we as a church are inviting our members and our friends uh, to bring uh, food items and toiletry uh, to the church uh, so that we can help to distribute these to people in need. And uh, there are two things that we're looking for, non-perishable food, uh, things like pasta, pasta sauce, uh, tinned meals, vegetables, uh, rice, cooking oil, things like that, uh, as well as toiletries, uh, toothpaste, toothbrushes, soap, and, and whatnot. Um, what you can do is that if you were shopping, particularly in Hurstful, uh, you can uh, buy extra item um, uh, so that you can share. And after you shop, uh, you can drop by to the church uh, during office hour in the office, or there is a collection box outside the office uh, during non-business hours that you can deposit. And we will take those items and we'll pass them on to uh, the agencies that will be responsible for distributing these. Uh, the information for this uh, project that we're doing uh, will be on our website during the week uh, if you want to know more information. Uh, there are lots of things uh, that are currently happening in the church. Uh, including if you want to find out more about uh, what the Bible says, uh, who Jesus is and what a, being a Christian is, uh, we, we would love for you to join us on a Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Uh, to do that. Uh, again, more information on that will be on our website. Um, uh, Christians love to give, and the Bible reminds us uh, of uh, what's really, really important in these words. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is a time that has demonstrated to us that our treasures on earth are fickle. They are a vanity. 
but there is a place that we can lay our treasure where they will never perish. Uh, if you love to give towards uh, um, um, the work uh, of uh, this kingdom, uh, the details should be on your screen next. And um, let me uh, lead us in praying uh, for what uh, has been given. Gracious God, all things come from you and you teach us to be generous with what we have. We pray that our gifts that has been given may be wisely used for the ministry of the gospel and the relief of those in need. And we pray this for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing our final song, O oh God Beyond All Praising, and I'm going to hand the time over to James and Angie to lead us in that. Thanks. Friends, uh, we have heard today that uh, in all circumstances, we can turn to our God in prayer, who is on his phone. And our present experience of suffering, whether uh, in uh, evil uh, or natural disasters, uh, will not be the final word, for God will bring it to an end one day. And we can be assured that he will save uh, 
our time now as God's people is to witness to that and, uh, and to worship this God. Uh, after this, there is a time where we can catch up in smaller groups. Uh, you'll be invited to join a breakout group if you choose to. Uh, on the other hand, you can remain in the main meeting. Uh, let me uh, pray for us uh, as we go forth into this uncertain world, uh, having heard from God that he is still on his throne. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for joining us uh, through the Zoom meeting and uh, online or on the phone. Uh, God bless you. And uh, let me invite you to continue to encourage one another in the small groups.